Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I'm your host, Sandy Shellis, and we have a packed show, as usual, for this third edition of Last Week in Collapse. I hope that you guys um, enjoy what I've put together with the help of Jared Brock. And I'm going to tell you, I know everybody is completely inundated or watching what has happened with the ship in, uh, the ship in, in Baltimore, right? So I had made a little video and maybe I'll show it to you really quickly and then we'll get started while all of you are joining. It was just, it, it was just a promo for the show. So here, I'm going to. So there we go. That was the, the new promo that I made uh, because it was easy. I mean, think about it. That barge represents industrialized civilization and the bridge is earth. And there we go, crashing in, metaphorically speaking. So before I get started, let me say good evening to everyone. And hi, Kristen and Tommyist and Kim, thank you for moderating. And hello, Looney Tunes and Tommyist and all of you that are here um, trying to see everybody. Let's make sure that tonight this is all uh, not a barge. It was a big cargo ship. Okay, there, this works. It was a huge cargo ship, very, very, very large. But since this show is called Last Week in Collapse, we're going to talk about everything that's happened last week. And probably by next week when I do this show, there's going to be a whole lot more about this gigantic cargo ship. You know, each one of those boxes is like a tractor trailer. There'll be a lot more information by then, and we'll talk about it then because everybody and their brother is covering it right now. So we're going to get started with this show. And here, here we go. All right, here we go. Last week in collapse. So to start. Much of the Caribbean and Latin America experienced its hottest March night in history with temperatures surpassing 27C, which is 80F. Some states also felt their hottest March days with temperatures exceeding 40C, which is 104 Fahrenheit, which is hot. And that actually was from the... Uh, uh, fizz.org, which is planet is on the brink with new heat records likely in 2024. In the United Nations global temperature smashed heat records last year as heat waves stalked oceans and glaciers suffered major record losses. The United Nations said Tuesday, warning that 2024 was likely to be even hotter. The annual state of the climate 
Report by UN Weather and Climate Agency confirmed preliminary data showing 2023 was by far the hottest, hottest year ever recorded. And last year capped off the warmest 10-year period on the report, the World Meteorological Organization said, with even hotter temperatures expected. There is high probability that 2024 will again break the record of 2023, the World Meteorological Organization Climate Monitoring Chief Omar Bedour told reporters. And reacting to the report, Antonio Guterres said it showed a planet on the brink. Earth's issuing a distress call, he said in a video message, pointing out that fossil fuel pollution is sending climate chaos off the charts and warning that changes are speeding up. And he's been sounding that alarm for how long? So meanwhile, an assessment of 150 Indian reservoirs found them lacking, filled to 40% capacity, their lowest levels in five years. Canada, Canada broke March records in some spots as well, and the Maldives. Canada also set a record for its warmest winter ever. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty heavy. And all the Canadians, everybody was complaining. Absolutely, you know, complaining. Where's the snow? Where's the snow? And so are we. So that's the record. A number of Central Asian countries saw record temperatures, which reached 35C and 95 Fahrenheit in some places. Even some locations in Saudi Arabia set new March records. Wow. The UN is warning 2024 will be even hotter, which is what we were looking at here. Even hotter. Hot, hot, hot. And this is uh, the global mean sea level rise over the past decade was more than double the rate. Mm -mm -mm. (sighs) Wow. Many Mediterranean countries are already facing serious drought, but that's incomparable with Afghanistan's drought. Rio de Janeiro hit its highest heat index in 10 years at 62.3 C, which is 144 Fahrenheit. The actual temperature was 42 C, which is 108 Fahrenheit. So you tell me, that's pretty bad. That's pretty hot. That is not what we expected to see in our lifetimes. Um, At least I didn't. At least in the seven, the last seven years, I realized, yeah, it was going to happen. Rio de Janeiro hit its highest heat index in in 10 years. So we, we went over that. As Independent Climate uh, Committee in Scotland, an Independent Climate Committee in Scotland has admitted there the predictable their 2030 climate targets are impossible to meet given how little progress they have made and then a nasa study determined that sea level rise rose 0.3 inches which is uh, 0.76 centimeters in 2023 and el nino is partly to blame so you can see this here uh around 40 miles of creeks in Wyoming were designated unable to sustain life after oil field discharges polluted them beyond their breaking point. So let's look at this first. This is the satellite record of sea level rise, global um, rise since 1993. And it, like everything, you know, when Jennifer and I do our shows, everything goes up, everything goes up. I do want to go through... um, I'm going to go over to this because this is what we were talk this is what they're talking about right now in the in Wyoming. And this is really interesting and it's very sad. Creeks tainted by drilling unable to sustain aquatic life. Wyoming Department DEQ acknowledges years of built up pollution from Monita Divide field but has no plan to remove the black sludge 6 feet deep. Two creeks tainted by decades of dumping from Monita Divide oil field drillers are officially impaired and unable to sustain aquatic life, state regulators say in a new report. Parts of 
alkali and bad water creeks in Fremont County are polluted to the point where they don't meet standards for drinking. Consumption of resident fish or sustaining aquatic life, a report by the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality states. The agency listed 40.8 miles of creeks as impaired in a biannual report required by the U.S. EPA. Parts of the creeks are polluted by oil field discharges, including hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and chloride. The industrial activity is responsible for low levels of oxygen in the water, turbidity, and a black sludge that critics say is up to six feet deep. Arsenic is also present, but state monitoring couldn't determine its origins. Huh. Okay. The report catalogs pollution downstream of discharge points where produced water effluent from natural gas and oil production flows from this 327,645-acre energy field operated mainly by Athon Energy operating in Fremont and Natrona counties. They're not putting the health and safety of these streams, water quality fish, and downstream water users above the interests uh, and profits of Athon. The impaired listings are a good thing that set the table for action, says Jill Morrison, who works on the pollution issue for the conservation group Powder River Basin Resource Council. Mm -hmm. But listing the listing comes only after years of badgering an agency that now should look to clean up the creeks. What we are saying is, well, thank you for stepping up to address these issues, Morrison said. We wish it was done sooner. You've got enforcement power. What steps are you taking to make Athon clean this up? Environmental stewards. The DEQ issued a revised permit to the private Dallas, you know, only in Texas company in 2020, allowing it to discharge oil field waste into Alkali Creek or Alkali, Al, Alka, Alkali Creek, which flows into Badwater Creek and the Boyson Reservoir, a source of drinking water for the town of Thermopolis. The permit calls for monitoring and testing a mother, among other things. Now, about a year ago, However, the DEQ sent the company a letter of violation for recurring, re reoccurring exceedances of water quality standards for sulfide, barium, radium, and temperature. That's a violation of Wyoming Environmental Quality Act states rules and regulations in the permit itself. And actually, Wyoming does have rules and regulations. Right now, the April 28th letter states that the DEQ hopes to resolve the violation through conference and conciliation. They want uh, Athon to show good faith efforts toward resolving the problem to prevent the need for more formal enforcement action by the office. The alleged kid glove treatment rankles Powder Rivers Morrison. They trade back and forth, nice conversations, and nothing happens. This is what one of the pumps look like that's polluting uh, Wyoming. They asked for a response in 30 days. Wyo file requested on March 6th that the agency provide a copy of Athon's response, but had not received it by publication time. So basically, it's it's not a good thing. And this Athon, they can they say they continually work to treat it, but you know, it, they're a fossil fuel company. Black sludge. The DEQ's impaired listing addresses surface water in two creeks through what's known as a draft integrated 305B report. It's open for comments through March 25th. But there's another issue that rankles critics, including the Wyoming Outdoor Council and the Powder Ridge Group, Black Sludge. Now, these are bottom deposits containing mineral deposits, iron sulfides, and dissolved solids, all contributing to low oxygen levels that kill aquatic life. So basically, don't go fishing there if you're a Wyoming sports person. And what are the wildlife drinking? You know, think about it. So 
You would not have that black gunk sediment if it weren't for Athon discharge, basically. A report of monitoring between 19 and 22 shows that aluminum exceeded discharge standards up to 17% of the time. So other than that, there's still a question of what's in the sludge. Isn't that lovely? What is in the sludge? I would love to know, and I suppose we're going to find out. And there was one other article that I had, which was the say it was back to this, which was the satellite record of sea level rise. And the new analysis sees the spike in global sea level due to El Nino. And I'm not going to go there, but that's what that was one of the articles that we had here. But Wyoming, that's very interesting because, you know, you, you like to think of Wyoming as a place that is, um, is oh hunting and fishing and wildlife and beautiful and clean and we're just finding out that well it's really not is it all right so back to last week in collapse a study concluded that antarctica's isotherm is shifting south in layman's terms this means the average temperatures closer to the South Pole are warming up, about four times faster than the rest of the world. The decrease in snowfall is also impacting sea ice patterns. Atlantic sea surface temperatures continue to break records, as we've seen in how many shows. And this is uh, the climate change is speeding up in Antarctica. And... I wanted to go down to, of course, here it was the, the, that was in February, 2022, the record breaking surface ice melt. And you see all of these over the last year, we have seen the lowest levels of Antarctic sea ice coverage since records began and events in recent years have bordered on the unbelievable. And it's difficult not to link them to climate change. Lovely. Just lovely. Oh, and an upcoming study to be published in the Journal of Climate proposes a new term for quantifying extreme heat. Outdoor days. If a day is too hot for comfort, it's not an outdoor day. The researchers made a website for people to simulate their own temperature limits and project future livability in the region. The study suggests that those living closer to the equator will unsurprisingly experience fewer outdoor days in the future, while people at greater latitudes will experience more overall outdoor days, although they will be scattered throughout the seasons. And this is the company and what they, 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 they there's a, you can go to this website and I will definitely put the link in here because it, it was quite interesting looking at the different countries for their Outdoor days, the number of days with moderate temperature, neither too cold nor too hot, that allows most people uh, to enjoy outdoor activities like walking, jogging, running, cycling, um, let's see, uh, you know, enjoying tourism and travel. They are derived from the 30 CM IP6 models under SSP1, 2.6, and SSP uh, five, 8.5 scenarios, which you could find in the IPCC reports. So I'm not going to go through much of this, but you know, you can look at every different country and you can put in and you can see, and it was based on this research that, that was in the American Meteorological Society. And here's the research that actually brought us to this research group, okay? And I have a little video that I'm going to play about heat. Become hot. As extreme heat waves become hotter and more frequent, some places are starting to feel nearly uninhabitable. The question is, with climate change, how much worse will it get? Scientists say it depends on what we do to cut our greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think that it's fair to say that those regions are, are in the near term, going to become too hot to live. There may be a, a point in time, decades in the future, 
maybe a century in the future where there will be regions that will really be difficult to live. When scientists think about what makes a place too hot to live in, it's not just the heat, it's also the humidity. We know a hot day feels worse when it's humid. There's good reason for that. Our bodies cool off by sweating, but that cooling system doesn't work as well when it's humid. I'll show you why. It's about 22 degrees here in the kitchen. This water is a little bit cooler, but when I take the thermometer out of the water and it's wet, the temperature is gonna start to go down, and that's water evaporating off the thermometer and carrying some of that heat with it. And that's basically the same thing we do when we sweat. We've got water on our skin, and it's evaporating, and it's carrying some of that heat with it. We don't just feel cooler, we actually are cooler. It's about 53% humidity here in the kitchen. Now we're gonna do the same thing right after a rainstorm. The humidity is up around 80%. When I take the thermometer out of the water, the temperature is gonna go down, but it's not gonna go down as much because the water evaporating off the thermometer doesn't have any place to go. When it was 54% humidity, there was plenty of space for that water to evaporate and carry off that heat. But now that it's up around 80%, that water is really gonna struggle to get off that thermometer and carry away that heat. And that's why a hot, humid day feels so much worse than a hot, dry day. Researchers measure the combination of heat and humidity with what they call the wet bulb temperature. You know, using words like wet bulb temperature, you know, it makes it sound very complicated, but it's just really simple. If the air is so hot and, and wet that you can't cool yourself, you overheat and you die. Researchers use six hours at a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius as the theoretical limit of what humans can survive, though the real limit may be lower. Some places in South Asia and the Persian Gulf have already hit 35 degrees in recent years, though only briefly. If it's hot now, it's going to get hotter in the future. That's where potentially you may start hitting these limits. The shores of the Persian Gulf are primed to hit that limit. The deserts around it are already scorching in the summer, and the Persian Gulf itself is shallow, so as it heats up, it soaks the air with humidity. Places like Dubai, Doha, Abu Dhabi, they are located next to the Gulf, and the air would blow from the water into the land, and those coastal areas would have very high water temperature. In the worst case scenario, models show areas right along the Persian Gulf coast may top that 35 degree wet bulb temperature by the end of the century. If the world limits its greenhouse gas emissions, the unlivable zones shrink to just a few spots. If. Some of the Persian Gulf countries might be able to adapt to these conditions better than most. They've got the money. Dubai already does massive climate engineering. They built an indoor ski slope in the desert. In that part of the world, there is resources to be used to help the population protect themselves from those conditions by having air conditioning and so on. Though air conditioning doesn't do much for people who work outside. Parts of South Asia, too, may become nearly unlivable for people who work outside. And that's most people in some of the places projected to be the hottest and most humid. Plus, most people in these areas can't afford air conditioning at home. That puts millions of people in harm's way. The combination of the hazard and the um, vulnerability of that population and the size of the population makes the region of South Asia maybe one of the highest risks for, for heat waves from climate change. The highest risk comes just before the monsoon. Temperatures rise through the first months of the year, but it's the humidity that arrives just before the rains that makes the heat especially dangerous. In the worst case scenario, models show a few spots in Northeast India and Bangladesh getting too hot to live in by the end of the century. Those spots go away if the world cuts emissions, but big swaths of if. South Asia would still be left with wet bulb <laughs> temperatures topping 31 degrees, which is extremely dangerous. You don't have to make a region uninhabitable to hurt a whole bunch of people and make everyone's life worse. And on its current path, the world is on track to get a lot worse. Many parts of the world are going to be in, in the situation where summer is going to be as hot and wet as the hottest heat wave that people will have experienced in their entire life today. And those include places where a lot of people live. That includes South Asia, that includes uh, Indonesia, that includes parts of Central and South America. Today, those heat waves kill. They strain power grids, they damage crops. 
Cutting emissions will lower the damage, but it won't eliminate it. Even places that don't get too hot to live in are going to have to adapt to living on a hotter planet. All right, so is that going to be uh, with air conditioning? <laughs> We're going to live on an air-conditioned planet. We're <laughs> the future, will it look like the Jetsons? Okay, so now you guys realize we're hot. We're hot. And that was a year ago. So it could be even, um, it could be even, you know, worse now. A shout out to Hi Jim Massa. By the way, I saw you joined. Shout out. All right. So we have gone over the outdoor days. We've gone over the heat. We've gone over, um, quite a bit. Now let's keep going. The Panama Canal, which received about 67% of its average annual rainfall last year, has come up with a temporary solution to its low water level locks, reusing water from its locks. This, however, comes at the expense of local water needs because the process is making the artificial Lake Gatun, Panama's largest lake, saltier and saltier. Not good. Extreme weather is impacting farmers in Malawi who are unable to grow substantial harvests. In Louisiana, 90% of a town's population left since a 2020 hurricane, leaving some 200 residents in scattered post-flood trailer settlements. And a Java, or Java, 250,000 plus were affected by a flood with at least five killed. Move on to Iceland. Iceland's long erupting volcano is emitting a sulfur dioxide cloud that is slowly moving across northern Europe, threatening the ozone layer. The CEO of Saudi Aramco, one of the top four most valuable companies worldwide, unsurprisingly called the Green Energy a uh, transition, a fantasy. And guess what get, guess what that gets? Okay. He gets this. Yeah. Or maybe even a toilet flush, <laughs> but it's a, it's a fantasy. So he's full of, he's full of gas in the real world. The current transition strategy is visibly failing on most fronts as it collides with five hard reality realities. We should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas and inv instead invest in them adequately, reflecting realistic demand assumptions. And then everybody can look like Wyoming. In the real world, the current transition strategy is visibly failing on most fronts, isn't it? A new study in science advances on tipping points in the AMOC suggests that its eventual collapse will occur in three abrupt stages. And again, I will wait for detail into AMOC and we'll do that with probably with Jim again. But here I will just go and read you that the intermediate um, TPs before freshwater induced collapse of the overturning circulation. A is the maximum strength of the AMOC as a function of freshwater forcing during a hysteresis experiment, materials and methods. The black gray crosses are the 50 year averages obtained after each forcing increment during the increasing or decreasing part of the hysteresis experiment. In blue, we show the actual trajectory in five year averages during the increasing uh, param oh, parameter sweep. As at the red crosses, we start, see right here, can you see them? I know it's kind of little. I don't know if I can make this bigger. Let's see. All right, I made it bigger. So at the red crosses, uh, where were we? I want to get, oh yeah, we start equilibrium simulations with fixed forcing, which form the basis for the construction of the stability landscape, which is again in the research, it's in the materials and the methods. The inset is a close up of the collapsing trajectory, which seems to consist of three steps, B to E collapsing. Close ups of the trajectory in one year averages show dis 
continuous changes in mean and variability of the AMOC strength as a response to gradual change in forcing. Isn't that just lovely? So there's a lot. All right, we move on from AMOC and we are going to UNESCO who released their 174 page World Water Development Report 2024. A 12 page executive summary is also available. The report states that all the sustainable development goals are being missed. Urbanization, consumption patterns, and population growth are stressing water resources. And 25% plus of world rivers tested for pharmacological contaminants. They exceeded safe concentration levels. So when you go to the bathroom and you're on medications all over the world, it's polluted the water. Interestingly, the report also claims water does not appear to have a prevalent trigger of conflict. The full report is worth browsing. So this is the months of year with severe water scarcity, the ratio of water demand to availability. So look at, check it out. Wow. There we go. The number of months which water scarcity is greater than 100%. And look, look, and even the United States, the South, the Southwest, Mexico, South America, Africa, Australia, parts of Europe, it's a conundrum, wouldn't you say? What did you say? And groundwater resources of Africa. Let's see. This is in major groundwater. They're showing you very high recharge and very low recharge. So there's, I don't know, not a lot of good news in Africa. That's for sure. Absolutely not. So we're going to move on. We're moving on to plastics pollution. How's that one? Let's move on to that. It is worsening with climate change. Manufacturing plastics creates emissions. Emissions drive temperatures higher. Uh, higher temperatures degrade plastics faster. Degraded plastics create the need for new plastics and microplastics. Manufacturing new plastics creates more emissions. The full study has more. So I, this was the in phys.org. Global warming and plastic pollution entwined in a vicious circle, researchers say. So it starts with impacts of the plastics, um, reducing, can you see? Yeah. Reducing properties, accelerating age, aging, rising microplastic risk, increasing demands. It's a vicious circle. One effect of global warming is faster deterioration, which in turn results in higher carbon emissions exacerbated plastic production and pollution. So they're going to keep making it and then it's going to cre keep increasing the emissions and then enhance climate change. So it goes around and around, right? Typically viewed as unrelated problems, global warming and plastic pollution are instead inextricably trapped in a vicious circle where one feeds the other. And plastics we rely on every day will deteriorate more rapidly because of rising global temperatures. And one effect will be a demand for more. So more and more and more. And probably, I wonder how many plastics and all that crap on that cargo, big gigantic crashed cargo ship was carrying plastics and crap for Dollar General. <laughs> we don't know. <clears throat> this was an old one. Uh, we are committed to the activities, but not committed to the results. Notes from an American Plastics Council medium meeting in January 1994 from Exxon, of course, our favorite company, right? All right, so we're going to move on. Bird flu has been detected for the first time in American livestock. Poultry are not considered livestock in according to U.S. Re regulations. Isn't that something? A goat at Minnesota and a Minnesota farm tested positive for H5N1. Brazil is fighting dengue mosquitoes with special mosquitoes infected with bacteria, which will also stop dengue fever. 
Again, let's see how well that goes. And let's segue over to the Federal Reserve. They have been given a supposedly difficult choice, permit a long-term economic decline, or more likely cut interest rates this year. U.S. commercial real estate is sagging and unlikely to bounce back strong. Meanwhile, Germany's economy is in recession and it's expected to stay there all year. The mosquito-borne bovine ephemeral fever is killing unvaccinated cattle in New South Wales and likely to spread because of climate change. And a heat wave canceled school and electricity across South Sudan. And that's a hot country. The head of WHO wrote an op-ed on the interdependence of global health with our environment, urging awareness and global action. Quote, we are now relearning what humans have always known, but which since the Industrial Revolution, we have forgotten or ignored that we harm our environment, we harm ourselves. More heat waves contribute to more cardiovascular disease, air pollution drives lung cancer, asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chemicals such as lead cause intellectual disability, cardiovascular and kidney disease, illegal wildlife trading also increases the risk of zoonotic spillover that can trigger a pandemic. The WHO estimates that pollution, waste and chemicals account for an estimated 14 million deaths a year. So if we keep on doing this, I guess the population's going to go down because of plastics. Oh, and a debt crisis grows for the global south. And Pakistan finalizes its latest debt bail- bailout from the IR- uh, IMF, $3 billion in total. A massive multi-billion dollar debt restructuring is slowly moving forward to target uncertain, uh, the ch- uncertain Chinese real estate sector. And guess what? Recent U.S. data on college loans suggests 2024 will be a better year for young people going into university debt, a sum of some $100 billion for all U.S. students. Now we move on to streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. Now that's rising in Japan with almost 400 cases cases nationwide in 2024. STSS has a CFR of about 30% and is contagious through respiratory droplets and wounds. Meanwhile, someone on the bird flu subreddit reported a rumor that a Vietnamese university student was killed last week by H5N1. Demographers predict a dropping world population within a couple of decades. In a growing number of countries, the shrinking population pressures collide with economic and migration goals. So the U.S. Supreme Court, well, they ruled that Texas can use broad arrest powers to hold suspected migrants. And the world's copious elections this year are alleged to have led to surging anti-migrant rhetoric worldwide. And yes, guys, it's not just the United States. No, it is not. Azerbaijan is demanding still more territory from Armenia after winning two recent armed conflicts against the long-suffering landlocked nation. Armenian officials believe another war is imminent one which could see the invasion of land beyond the recently ceded Nagorno-Karabakh territory. Meanwhile, one of Libya's governments closed a border crossing with Tunisia over gun violence in Wasbian Libya. Another Darfur genocide is looming, or already happening. The latest Sudan war. It hurts me to even think about that country. Almost one year old is resulting in Arab militiamen terrorizing and killing the black Masalits. Over 5 million Sudanese are on the brink of famine, according to the UN. In eastern DRC, an intergenerational conflict threatens to destabilize the region as M23 and other gangs recruit hopeless soldiers for their offenses. And starvation worsens in Yemen. And farmers protest in Europe. Those continue. And India as well. Uganda's 79-year-old dictator appointed his son 
to lead the military, cementing a dangerous future transition. Sound familiar? A mass grave was discovered in Libya, which is suspected to contain the bodies of 65 trafficked humans. Venezuela's president arrested members of his opposition. And some of Myanmar's junta soldiers fled into Thailand where, when ethnic militias attacked them. As the junta loses ground, reprisals unto civilians are increasing. And healthcare. Haiti's healthcare system has collapsed and hunger is growing. A Pakistani official alleged that Pakistan's government would consider seizing the mountainous Wakhan Corridor for Afghanistan if Afghan forces continue attacks on Pakistani territory. Such a move would separate Afghanistan from China and open a border between Tajikistan and Pakistan. Pakistan also conducted a retaliatory airstrike in Afghanistan, reportedly killing eight, all women or children. Clashes between protesters and security forces happened last week in Argentina, a hundred days after Javier Millet took power, beginning severe austerity policies to social services. Iraq is planning to stop all aid to IDP camps in its autonomous region of Kurdistan at the end of July. Protesters protesters marched in Cuba over blackouts and hunger, chanting Corriente y Comida, power and food, and Niger is kicking out U.S. troops, several hundred personnel in total. Goodbye. Don't say you weren't warned. The government in Germany is seeking to make the nation now Kriegelstig, and I cannot do German very well. War ready and resilient. Their education minister wants civil defense programs bought to schools in advance of potential conflict with Russia. Anyone? In the UK, a group of defense experts released a report online about international security urging preparation for war. And Latvia is urging conscription to its European allies. Russia has begun mass manufacturing a three-ton bomb to use in Ukraine. The weapon is an all-purpose aerial bomb for blasting structures and marks an escalation from the 1.5-ton bombs dropped last year. The Russian military industrial complex is also scaling up production of a 500-kilogram and a and, and 1.5-ton bombs. An American admiral claims China is on track for a 2027 invasion of Taiwan after analysts concluded China grew its air force by some 400 planes in the last three years, is dramatically scaling up nuclear weapons production, and has increased its satellite fleet by 100%. And on Friday... A terror attack at a concert hall outside of Moscow killed 137 plus. The Islamic State claimed the deeds of the four detained attackers. That same day, Russia launched a massive strike at Ukraine's energy infrastructure, leaving over a million people without power. Ukraine has vowed to continue strikes on Russian oil facilities. Ukraine is building a domestic MIC to meet their ammunition demands and prevent further rollback from Russian soldiers. And a Russian missile missile entered Polish airspace, airspace briefly before landing in Ukraine. And our favorite guy, Netanyahu, he's again vowed to move forward with an offensive into Rafah, despite mounting pressure for a ceasefire. Illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank are also increasing as the war drags on and on all over the world. The price of onions in Gaza has skyrocketed amid the deadly food shortages. Red Sea ship traffic through the Suez Canal has dropped 60% since the Houthi attacks began months ago. Many ships rerouted around Cape Town, adding $300,000 in fuel expenses for each ship, plus two weeks delay and some emissions. 
So there we, we see the area. All right. And uh, let's see. I just want to make this bigger here. All right. So the Gaza Strip, here we are. This is where everybody is so concerned. But as you see, it is, it's not just, it's not just over there. It's so many different countries. And it is just so serious that we, we can't, we can't get along. We can't get along. Human beings just don't want to get along with each other. And what are they fighting over? Now it's going to be resources. It's going to be food. It's going to be heat. It's going to be migration. And that's just last week. So let's see what you guys are talking about. All of you that um, have come here. I know a bunch are, are watching on Twitter because I saw, I've only shared it to Twitter and I think there's what, 20, 49 people watching. So hello over there on X. And uh, I have to consider whether I want to continue that because I wouldn't mind everybody being here in the chat, but that's okay. That's okay. So let's see what you guys are doing and saying. Uh, Jared Kushner. <laughs> yeah, Jared Kushner can't wait for Israel to get a, a hold of the lucrative Gaza real estate. I saw that. He said it. He said it. Okay. Danny wants people to get pissed instead of doomed because the rich will outlive us. Sorry, that's a fact to me. Yes, I don't think you're you're wrong in that, Dan Donald, at all. At all. Oh, God, look at that. He's right. The most fought over beachfront for two to three thousand years. It feels like it's never going to stop. It feels like it's never going to stop. Let me say thank you to the people that are so generous and lovely. Uh, thank you, Chaz, very much. Okay, thank you. And Nadia, uh, Percy Marks, The Plastic Age, Clara Bow was in the film, was supposed to mean something more like the formative years. Not everyone eating an entire credit card's worth of plastic every week. I'm trying not to. I use things over, but it's very hard. In this society, there, it's very hard. Again, Nadia, thank you for your generosity. My German friends are terrified that their puppet, Kanzler, bending over for Biden bombing, Nord Stream, will drive Germany to, uh, you see it, with Russia and Berlin. So they want to flee to Tbilisi, Georgia. That's very interesting. Geopolitics. There's quite a few channels that do some really good work on, on geopolitical uh, stuff. And let's go back to Wyoming. It's a toxic waste dump, an environmental brownfield disaster from one end to the other. Thank you. Collapse Chronicles. Such a shame. And Jim, remember the coldest La Nina's of the past 20 years are warmer than the hottest El Nino of the past 30 to 40 years. So you understand that. What does that mean? It means we're kind of screwed, doesn't it? Yep. All right, guys. We are ready. To, I'm ready to take a few more comments here. Uh, let's see, Stephen K. You're saying uh, if they're stupid enough to believe that their wealth will do anything beyond the collapse of most systems that drive their wealth and currency itself will be worthless. Interesting. You guys definitely have interesting conversations. Now you said, uh, Anticorpus, hi, how is that possible? I drove through Wyoming all the time and it's huge. Yeah, it's hugely polluted in many, many lake regions. Yep, the place that, you know, the wildlife, the waterways, wildlife like to, to get their, you know, sustenance. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes, I know that was in reference to billionaires. Yep. 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 Oh, and that's right. Nadia, thank you for donating a lot of those memberships. That was very lovely. 
The problem with YouTube, it's very weird, but if they, if it's, I, uh, some people are not happy with these memberships. I literally had to hide one from the channel because he was just incredibly rude about, uh, well, he was a, a denier, you know, and so it's a shame that YouTube does not have a way of making sure that the, um, that the, 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 those kinds of things, the memberships go to subscribers to the channel. That's how it really should be. Don't you think? Well, I do. I do. I do. All right, guys. So anybody have any questions or anything? Um, oh yeah. Missouri got cold again. I can't wait to start gardening. Well, I'm growing a lot of stuff too, Scott. And Scott and I do talk a lot about what we will be growing this year. And we have green stalks that we have out. We send pictures back and forth. And my flats are starting to really come up, which is exciting, you know. Yeah, and Nadia, I know. I know you censored your super chat so that YouTube doesn't. I, I totally understand. Mm-hmm. The Guardian article from March 20th, 2021, our biggest challenge, lack of immigration, the scientists turning, oh, lack of imagination, sorry, the scientists turning desert green, make America green again. Yes, yes. Okay, guys. Um, hello, Gazer. How are you? When the guy with a sack of potatoes is worth more than the guy with a sack of cash, then we are doomed. And tonight I would like to do the Environmental Coffee House Flush of the Day. I'd actually like to do it. Well, maybe I'll have one of you guys pick. Does anybody know what they would like the flush of the day? What what would you like to flush? Hmm? I mean, I could think of a lot of things I'd like to flush, actually. I would really like to flush that. I, I tell you what, I'm going to flush the oil company in Montana right down the toilet. Bye-bye. There you go. Yeah, this it wouldn't be bad. We could do two of them. Okay. Stephen Miller and Jared Kushner. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I gotcha. I know. We're supposed to have, believe it or not, it, it's like the, the, well, it's weather whiplash. We're getting, uh, it's going to be in a couple of days, the beginning of April. Before the eclipse, we're going to be getting uh, back to ridiculously cold weather, which means that I will have to uh, cover my fruit trees again. Environmental Coffee House, a friend of mine and his wife were on holiday there and had to evacuate their hotel for even when it, for it, even when they had nothing to do with it, no interest and no awareness of it. Oh my gosh. Oh, hi, Raza. It's great to see you here. Love to all doomers. You rock. Well, it's, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult uh, stuff uh, to, to read. But as you as we go around the world now every week on Tuesdays and we see we see all of the climate effects, the environmental effects, wars, fighting, droughts, fires. I mean, it, it's just it's it is overwhelming. And yes, the April 8th eclipse, I hope I am able to see it from here. And thank you, thank you, call to actions. Well, actually, we'll be talking about some call to actions because Roger Hallam has agreed to let me interview him. I have him coming up. I have quite a few things coming up, actually, on interviews, interviews on Friday nights. And don't envelope yourself into too much doom. Do happy things. Well, that's what all of us, a lot of us do. We grow food and we do get involved in local activities, which is great. Hello, Connor Arroyo. Yeah, dare to keep humans from in infecting the galaxy. We already have, sweetheart. Yep, 
he will be here with me. We have been corresponding. So that is exciting, actually, to me. So as long as I didn't, I did not miss anybody. We are just shy of an hour. I went through everything that I wanted to go through. Um, and I want to thank you guys. And Friday night, I have actually, I have somebody Friday night not a star, nobody, you know, but you all know him, void of saying, void of saying, Drew Hempel. I invited Drew to come on because Drew has been talking about the algae project. He's going to tell us all about himself, his activism, the algae project. We get to meet him. He does his Qigong uh, meditations on his own channel a couple uh, maybe a, a, in the morning sometimes I join him but I'm it's very difficult for me to meditate but I try you know I try so yeah yeah <laughs> good show we all do our best that's right and you know it may be very doomy and I mean, we look at all of the stuff and, and you say it's doomy, but yet we still are here. We still have lives. We still have interests. We still have families. We still have people we love, right? So those are the things that we need to think about on a daily basis. But then you come here, come here twice a week. And Tuesdays for the new show, which will help me in the, in the summertime because they're easier to do, even though they're very difficult. Right. And uh, I'll see you on Friday with Drew. It's, it actually should be a very interesting show because he's a very interesting guy. And he's been commenting on everybody's channel for years, years and years. Again, he's not famous. Elliot will be back with me in April. Actually, Elliot will be back with me on a Tuesday night. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I know it is, but not for me. <laughs> I always have my brain going. Good night, guys. You know how much I love you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, left past 10 tomorrow night, 10 o'clock Eastern.